Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> well, let's get right to it. I'm going to, my name's Abigail Spencer. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, to my inner circle known as the biggest, the comeback fan ever. And it is my utter joy and extreme pleasure to introduce the star, creator, and executive producer of the comeback, Lisa Kudrow. Also, we have also the creator, executive producer, and director of the comeback, Michael Patrick King. We have producer and Billy, Dan Pukatinsky. And also, last but certainly not least, the, the puppeteer of the comeback, Jane Benson, Miss Laura Silverman. And we were also going to have another actor join us this week, um, Robert Michael Morris, but unfortunately he passed on May 30th. And we just want to have a moment to honor him and his incredible performance of Mickey Dean. Yeah. Uh, he died uh, Tuesday, and on Monday he called me. And uh, the reason he called me is to let me know from the hospital that he wanted me to know that he wouldn't be able to make it to this festival. And he wanted, didn't want anyone <laughs> to be disappointed. Um, and he wanted to say, I don't, he actually said, I don't think I'm going to be able to make it. <laughs> and he died the next day. Now, I have had a very long relationship with uh, Michael. He was my college theater teacher. And when Lisa and I started to uh, create the comeback, we knew she had to have uh, undying support. And we knew actress, probably hairdresser. And I said to Lisa, I have somebody in mind. And the reason we wanted Michael, and the reason it worked is because he was retired from acting, and he actually is such a personality, it felt like somebody who wandered in from a reality show. <laughs> and that was our whole goal, to not have acting visible. Right. And uh, he came in and did it. He came in to an HBO network test for his first audition oh, in his life. And what did he bring you? Oh, he brought me a necklace. Of QVC. Right. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, we bought everything on QVC. And, uh, and it was really beautiful and sweet. I immediately put it on, and it felt like a good luck charm, and he was fantastic. And it was, there was no debate from HBO, even, no. about no, we had, we had that it had to, to be him. We had auditioned a lot of people, a lot of accomplished actors, you know, and what they were trying to approximate was what, in fact, was the authentic, one-of-a-kind, uh, you know, Robert Michael Morris, which he, he's the only person who could have played that part. And then, oddly enough, um, in the 10 years <laughs> between the la first Mickey and the second Mickey, he was sick. He got sick at the last couple of years, and we actually started the second season knowing he had stage four uh, melanoma. And he was uninsurable, and HBO let us proceed anyway, because they said, we think, I said, and Lisa said, we think he can do it. And every day was an amazing gift because it was seeing someone so happy. And the first day was a little tough. He was sweating like, I don't know if I can do this. And then yeah. he just got better and better and better and better yeah. and better. It was like he was, he was getting well as we went along. And it was crazy, but true. And then the ruthless thing and the good thing that we did with everything we ever wrote for the comeback is we, we played as close to real life as possible. With, you know, we mostly just parodied television, acting, reality, marriages. And with Michael, we parodied the fact that he was sick. So, but, so that last scene meant a lot to us. Oh my gosh. That, that scene, not to jump ahead, but that last scene of season two is, I, I call it the best delayed gratification of a series in the history of time because I've seen the series. Uh, several times, and that moment, I mean, it's like, it comes out of nowhere, and just like, T 
tears like st shoot straight out of my eyeballs and I can't, I can't help it. And Mickey really became the heart of the show and really the conscience. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. For yes, Valerie, did. Can, yeah. can you guys talk about how you kind of developed that in season one and the relationship with Mickey and Valerie? And then I want to talk about kind of how it all came to be. I want the inception story <laughs> to come back. Well, well, why don't we also, I mean, because Laura's here. So the other, the, um, the other person that when we're writing the pilot, Michael is, you know, we're acting scenes out and he's the voice of Mickey and he's saying, I'm being specific because I have someone specific in mind. And for Jane, I was doing the voice of Laura Silverman because I know I knew who Laura Silverman was. <laughs> I hadn't met her. Each other? No. Oh, okay. We didn't really know each other. No. But, but she's right? a very she's a very special person whose work we knew, and also Laura has that thing where she doesn't seem like she's acting. Yeah. No, no, it's completely honest and truthful. So when we were writing it, oh. I was like, just it, I, it's it's got to be Laura. I really hope it can be Laura. It's got to be Laura, because who else can be Jane? To be so honest, blank, and you can't feel the agenda, you know, if, even though she's practically saying it out loud. But <laughs> it's just like that's the only, that's the only person and it can possibly be. And then she read, be. and we were like, yeah. And then, yeah, and again, no discussion from HBO about, yeah, yeah, it has to be her. Um, it was really thrilling. <laughs> Laura, how'd you feel when you got the call to come in for it and they were like, we wrote a part for you? Oh, well, I didn't know that actually until the, when after I was cast, which I didn't even find out that I got the part until like two weeks after the network test. So I had no oh. idea. And I, <laughs> what? I, um, we were at the first table read and Michael came over to me and he put his hands on my shoulders and he whispered in my ear, you know we wrote this with you in mind. And I was like, no, I didn't know that. And it might have been nice if I did, because I've been sweating bullets for the last month. Um, yeah, but it was actually, you know, I had been having trouble, a bit of trouble, you know, getting parts. And it was really nice when I came in to read, and I read with Lisa, which is unheard of. Like, you don't go and read with, like, a, the star of the show for your first audition. and. Um, when we finished, she kind of like sighed and she went like, oh, finally. And I just, it was like one of the best feelings I've ever had because somebody like responded well to just what I like instinctively do. And then, um, yeah, and it uh, was really, felt really good. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't feel bad. <laughs> And of course, we wrote Billy for Danny. Yeah. I mean, we literally just told Danny's energy. That was a little backward. Yeah, yeah, you, I was already involved in the show at the time. And yeah, then, and we were like, we have Billy something emerged. for you. Yeah. They made him do it. They made, yeah, you had he to really He was retired from acting, and then look what happened. Yeah. <laughs> How do you guys know each other? How do you guys know Dan? Like, like since you guys thought of him for that, and you were already involved, how did, how did that conversation begin well lisa and i first uh this is a very decadent story but lisa and i i knew lisa's work from the groundlings i had gone to see her perform and she did the most bizarre sketch i've ever seen which was audrey hepburn on a fishing show <laughs> in a rowboat and what you really need to know is there was no even nod to the fact that she was trying to imitate audrey hepburn <laughs> but she was something and so I was trying to imitate Audrey Hepburn. <laughs> so ouch. Ouch. Yeah. Ouch. <laughs> Burn. Uh, all right. Well, anyway, it was funny. And then I knew her a little bit. And then Lisa and I met on uh, we were both doing she was on Mad About You playing the 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 waitress and I had a show called Good uh, Sports and we would see each other and say hi, uh, and then I got Sex in the City, she got Friends, and then we would see each other at the Golden Globes every year from yeah, far we'd away. Have to, the Friends table had to like scooch out of the way so the Sex in the City people could get by to collect their award. <laughs> and then everyone at my, t and I'd be chit-chatting with Michael, and they'd say, why do you know him? <laughs> they just beat us. It's like, what does it have to do with anything, okay. And that's how, and then we, we, and then we, 
both done We're with done. our shows around the same time. Yeah, so that was 2004. You, yeah. you finished Friends, yeah. mm -hmm. and then you were finishing Sex in the City. Yeah. And then what was the next conversation that kind of procured this idea? Was this something you guys had talked about loosely before? We, we were partners. Elisa and I became um, producing partners in 2003. Three. Oh, okay. And it's like, I think a year later, I remember you guys were going to meet and have lunch. And yeah, our agent <clears> said, you're both available and you have lunch. It's like, all right. I mean, I'm not doing another show. And Michael went, all right. Yeah, we already know each other. I'm not doing another show. Mm. And we had right lunch. Right now. Yeah. 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 And so we had, yeah, right now. And so we had lunch and I said, look, if I, I'd have this one I. Dia, and it was not even fully formed, but at all. And I just said, it's something in this vein, in this world. And Michael, well, first she got did. It. I did an the actress character. character. Yeah. Yeah, which you, you you had that panel character from the Groundlings, right? Who had been yeah. on the your favorite actress on a talk show, <laughs> is what it was called. And I she had immediately name. was like <laughs> locked in. Oh. And then Lisa said, but I don't know what. What will we do with it? Yeah, and we just kept talking and talking. It was like a three, four hour lunch. And by the end of it, he said, you understand we have um, an, a, a series or we have, a, I don't know what. I just know then we had one other meeting. He said, you understand we have the arc of the, of the, of the first season right now. And I said, we do? That's fantastic. <laughs> And now, had yeah. this been something that you and Dan had been kind of tossing around too, as you guys were thinking of producing and becoming partners? Like, like, or, or like, is that kind of how you work? Is like based on the character, and then it kind of the germ of an idea, and it, it keeps developing into something else. Like, tell tell me about that process. Well, the, the it wasn't so much the character; it was the idea of you know two thousand. You have to remember two thousand four. Mm -hmm. There had been Survivor and one season of Amazing Race. There were no housewives yet. Oh. There was just like Anna Nicole. And the Osbournes, oh, yeah. basically. Oh, yeah. And all I could think was, and I saw Amazing Race, where this couple, this married couple, were screaming at each other. And one of her tasks was to eat spicy food that made her vomit, <laughs> but get it down. And her husband is screaming at her because she keeps vomiting. And she's <laughs> vomiting and crying on national television. And that was. 2004 and when it was riveting but no i didn't think it was riveting i thought this is the decline of civilization and because this is really before social media yes yeah, it's yeah. 2004 when there was still such a thing as uh self-respect dignity. dignity privacy you know and and privacy and and i just thought this is a bad direction mm. it's going in a bad direction and and i think we all knew that you know, there were writers who were losing deals because it was more, it was more cost effective for a network to do a certain number of reality shows. So scripted shows were going away. And um, it was definitely a changing of the guard. And we were like, hey, what's happening right now? And then for an actress of a certain age to be caught in the middle of everything shifting from scripted to what it is now is interesting. But it was driven by an idea. Like, I, you know, Lisa and I started the company, and we were very much thrown into a very typical producing. You know, we were meeting a lot of writers. We were at a studio. We were at Warner Brothers. We were developing pilots in a very traditional way. And Lisa wasn't looking for the next thing. And, and you know, and Michael was just off of Sex and the City. They got together and got excited in that purest and most organic of ways, which is, here's an idea, and yes and, yes and, yes and, and, the, and it emerged from it something bigger than the desire to go, I need to find something for myself. Oh yeah, it was definitely well, an idea. You feel that, it feels completely pure, and I really wondered that about how its evolution. So once you got excited about this idea, what was the next step was, did you just think HBO? Well, because, well yes. Okay. We went to HBO, who was more than happy at that point to have Lisa Kudrow, because she was Hot, hot, hot. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. you were. And I was coming Patrick off a show yeah. that had done well for them too. Just but here's the interesting thing. <laughs> here's the interesting thing. So Lisa and I, we went and we told them the idea, and it was this. I'll never forget uh -huh. it. <laughs> uh, all right. Like nobody. You have to understand. No one had done this. Yeah. And the other thing was, yeah. no one was expecting a character on the page when you read. Valerie. It's not funny when it's you read it. It's not funny. And so, you know, they, well, they went, yeah, we don't get it. Well, actually, when we pitched it, they went, not sure I get it, but why don't you just do it anyway? Because 
they, they allowed why him wouldn't they? to do that at that time. Yeah. 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 And then we, we wrote it and we and by the way, I, this is what I want to say too, that Lisa is a phenomenal writer. This isn't a oh, this isn't a vanity like I wrote it and Lisa was in the room. Lisa and I thank you. hammered out that pilot and every episode word by word by word by word. But at first it was just Lisa and I in a room. And she has such a great, weird sensibility that she'll say something, and this happened in the pilot, she'll say, like one day she came in, she just said, I, I, I think there's a leak. There's a leak in the water in the wall, there's a leak somewhere, and it, she ignores it. And I was like, but we're not, we're doing this scene now. <laughs> and she'd be like, no, there's a leak. And it wound up being the whole thread of the show is that Valerie pays more attention to her She's professional life. She's not paying attention to her home. Than her, Life. Than her personal life, and it winds up exploding and destroying her life. And that last scene is her in front of a destroyed career wall, mm -hmm. ignoring that because she got a job. <laughs> also, they both come from improv, amazing improvisers, and the show is absolutely not improvised. The show is every that single word of every gasp, everything is on the page. Yeah. And we, at one point in the writing room, we thought we have to get a court stenographer. Yeah. Because yeah. we yeah. really, they're too expensive, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> You could get very, writers very for cheaper. But, <laughs> Writing um, assistants. Yeah. But here's the thing. Every, uh, 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 everything Lisa would strive to f discover as Valerie, I was at that computer going, uh, A-H, dash, dash, A-H, dash, dash, A-H, exactly. And then my extreme joy was months later, and then 10 years later, to see Lisa before a scene wandering around with the script going, uh, 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 exactly taking her back to the impulse. It was scripted. Everything, everybody said on the show was scripted. Well, it felt like a great ballet. And, and that's kind of what I've been wondering are some of the mechanics and the technicalities. Like, because the cameras are a character in the scene and curious how much rehearsal that you guys did to kind of create those moments. The, the cameraman and I used to run lot so they would say you want to run lines and that would be like we would you know just rehearse together how because even if michael wanted to see a little piece of my hair at a certain moment it was very specific exactly how much of it he wanted to see and exactly when and we would practice it. I got hit in the head with the camera a lot too. Uh, we, we found it's, that it's a unique show that we discovered in the middle is that Valerie's never off camera. Mm -hmm. she, there's never a scene where anybody says, what's her problem? Mm -hmm. Like in normal writing. So we realized in order to tell the subtext, we had to frame each shot so there was leaking stories and you could see people seeing her, seeing things. and. It Everything that you see is planned. It's yeah, amazing. So That's why it pisses me off that Michael never won an Emmy for directing. Yeah. It really does. Yeah, yeah, that's because a people think that it. it it's because not. It, I'm well, fine. I have one. No, it makes. <laughs> okay. For directing this show. Because people think, because it's so masterfully done that it looks like it all just happened and none of it just happened. No, none of it. That's my Every little eye and thing design. you see. Yeah. Every background is performer. Every background, every little thing, it's all. He's I remember looking the, at all of it and it all happens like with purpose. There's one scene we wanted to let the audience know what Pauly G and uh, Tom feel about Valerie early. And there's a scene at the end of the upfronts where she's walking down a hall and we stage them coming out of the men's room, seeing her, making their eyes and go back. And I know she exactly didn't see the it. <laughs> Speaking of uh, other cast members, what was the most difficult role to cast, and what was the casting process when you were looking at, you know, uh, Lance Barber, and you know, I mean, just some of these great. The whole world just felt so real. What what was the most difficult role to cast? Mark. Oh yeah. Mark. Mm -hmm. I mean, Lance and um, and Robert Bagnell. I, I mean, they were like, yeah. they like to me. At one point, I said to Lisa in the cookie rape scene where Valerie goes in the first season to give them cookies and they're making fun of her in the writing room, I actually said <laughs> to the director, this is a documentary <laughs> of what I know about television. Yeah. Yeah. When she says, give them another break, give them another break, and they say, you want to start the hate show? I was like, yeah, this is a documentary of what I know about bad sitcom world. Mm. But the love interest, Mark, yeah. 
was really hard to find because it had to be somebody who also wasn't an, an actor. Yeah. Right. And he yeah. was so important, Lisa, right, Mark? Yeah, I mean, at first I had it wrong. Or in my head, Mark was older, and so she did her fun stuff and he didn't really need to pay attention to whatever she was doing. And I thought, well, that's going to be an older guy who has money so she doesn't have to worry. I mean, the one thing was this character can't need money. She's not doing this because she has a mortgage to pay or bills to pay. She has to be willingly throwing She's herself willingly in front of the train. She's willingly throwing herself, yeah. I won't, <laughs> I won't just repeat everything you said. <laughs> I like it. I like but, it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then, but then, um, and so, <laughs> but then, Michael knew Damien Young because you had worked with him, yeah. probably on Sex and the City. Yeah, yeah. and you went, that's the He's guy, I think. He's a New York actor. He's a New York actor. Yeah, yeah. So he just put himself on tape. Mm. And, okay, yeah, that's it. And the thing we got out of that was that Valerie had a hot sex yeah. life. Yeah. And I think that went further. That was, that, yeah. was, that was a definite improvement. Yeah. yeah. It definitely really set up for season two, I mean, casting him, I mean, could, did you have any idea when you were casting him of where that storyline would go yeah. in season one? Yeah. Because we laid it in in season one when they're at Juna's show and he's with his work partner who's an attractive woman and they were dirty dancing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Right. And also, at the very last shot of him in the season finale of the first season, I'm happy to say now that there's right. a second, uh, <laughs> was that Valerie's, he knows how awful she was treated. And then when he sees her signing those vomit bags, mm -hmm. her autograph, there's a look on his face that informed the entire next season, which is what happens. He's seen a, a woman who knows what's bad for her now. Because he never knew Valerie as an actress. Right. right. Now, talk to me about drawing when you when you said you know this is a documentary how how much were you drawing from your own experiences i mean and and you don't have to add anything but it is i'm an actress as well and it is painfully honest i have had all those feelings and and when i watched the comeback for the first time i was like someone else knows how i feel in the world <laughs> it was a great relief even though the dial is turned up, but then not at all. So can you talk about, I mean, some people call the show a whistle-blowing show and, you know, a show about show business. It's really hard to do, and it's just so honest. So tell me more about drawing on I, that. The first thing I have to say is that this had nothing to do with my experience on Friends, <laughs> honestly. <laughs> but I, ha I think that's what people suspect. And it honestly didn't, because that was a fantastic experience. I mean, I did hear stories about the writer's room. <laughs> One of the first but. weeks in the writer's room, Lisa was in with all the writers, and she started hearing these stories about how writers feel about certain actors, and she was like, what the hell? What the hell? <laughs> What is going on behind this in the writing room? Shoot. And I really did send cookies to the writer's room because I knew that they were working really late and felt really unappreciated. And I thought, well, I love cookies <laughs> or baked goods at night. So, and then cookies? at least I th it might go a long way toward, you know, some appreciation. And I honestly did that, yeah. you know, and not so that they would write me better stuff because they were already <laughs> writing yeah. Yeah, yeah. perfectly fine yeah. stuff. I but let me premise what I'm about to say by saying I love actors and I am a writer and this is the truth <laughs> of what I know there are actresses that I is directly a hybrid from two people I won't tell you two different actresses I know stars when you say you were really good in that scene they give you the <laughs> The yoga blessing thank you hands is what we called them in the script. Oh, uh, so good. And, um, and then... The <laughs> I remember, well, how do we... Yoga blessing thank you hands. And, uh, and they are. Um, and so I knew that. And also I knew uh, actresses who would, talk, would keep you in their office for two hours, speaking nonstop. And you realize at the end, oh, they just want should change to could. <laughs> but you have to weed through it. So there's a little verbosity to Valerie that I loved. And also, I know, I know writers like that who don't like actors. And I'm not one of them, I have to say. Yeah, yeah absolutely. 
Um, I don't like women. That's even more important. More important. Well, I think it's more important to this show that yeah. Polly G didn't like women. Yeah. No, it, it, it truly is. It's, it's uh, wonderfully done. It really is. And for people who aren't in show business, I think it's hard to wrap their heads around that it's actually like that, and that's what was so amazing for me to see. I, I, I don't agree with that, okay. though, because I think you don't have to be in show business to experience that kind of um, ageism mm. or, you know, just uh, sexism. Yeah. And someone who just doesn't like you and you don't know why. Yeah. I mean, Polly G was perfectly fine with Juna, yeah. but Valerie pissed him off on different levels that he wasn't even aware of. And, that, and, and, and to the writing, we always made sure that Valerie put the gun at herself. Mm. It wasn't like she was a victim that people didn't like. So that was a problem. She would always sort of go too far, which was what's so complicated about the character in the first season. And also, when we were doing the show, people hadn't really embraced or even seen that black, dark comedy, yeah. anti-hero thing, which is so current now. Yeah. yeah. Also, the uh, Pauly G was so disgusted by the bald need or narcissism that was so exposing and exposed by having an actress who insisted on having cameras. I mean, the whole no, premise. No, no, but it wasn't her. No, it was the show. It was the show, and I think he was taking it out on her because yeah. I really, we luckily did. We put in there that you know, the bags, network wanted but that. Tom Peterman, you know, was explaining to her. He was like, yeah, he's, you know, he, we wrote on The Simpsons, which was like the top job you, that's like the harvard of writing okay we were on the simpsons and and you know won an emmy so and they wrote a show and the network made them change it and then to hedge their bets because they weren't convinced that the show would be a hit they forced them to have this reality crew around and even though she didn't fit in their new idea you got to keep her because now we have the reality so they had to it wasn't their show anymore as you can and see I think we that's argued infuriating. a lot Lisa and I and all the writers argued a lot for the other point of view, so it was. Yeah. yeah, you feel everybody's right in what they believe and what they want from their perspective. Including yeah. Jane. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Especially oh, yeah. in that second season when Jane is sort of dragged back by her, what, her heart, her feelings? I guess. <laughs> well, before we get into the second season, we actually, um, Lisa, why don't you set this up? We've got a, a, a clip from the beginning of season two. And can you, before we, we show that, can you just speak to the, I don't need to see that line and, and how that came about. That, that run, I mean, that run all through season one right. and it transitions us into season two. Yeah, I mean, it's a sitcom hook. So Michael and I were figuring out a sitcom hook, and the first one was get a room, <laughs> you know, because that was sort of a sitcom already hook there. already out there. And then we decided it was, um, no, no, let's make it a little less easy than that. Like, a, you know, and, and so it was, you know, note to self was like a quasi clever one, yeah. you know. And it's like, well, note to self, I don't need to see that, you know. Oh and God. and then she'll do it in that over-the-top sitcom way that if it were maybe just a little more thrown away, it could be sort of funny, yeah. you know, but she did just over the top, yeah. like she did every sitcom joke. And, and the obsession of what actors have to, oh, and yeah. to go through for one line. Yeah. <laughs> well, especially when it's a good joke and, you know, some people just obsess instead of, well, I mean, feel it yeah. and then do it, but she's not an artist. Mm -hmm. That was the other point. She's not an artist. I love that. Yeah. Um, so let's set up for, do we have our clips ready for the um, beginning of season two? I don't know. Uh, do I point at someone and it happens? <laughs> um, <laughs> Thumbs up? Okay. okay so let's pick us some clips. Show the this this will show do. you where Valerie's been for the 10 years. So good, so good, so good. Um, oh, I love it so much. <laughs> you were doing your Matthew McConaughey. No, oh, so good, so good. So good. <laughs> um, talk about 
the 10 years in between season one and season two? What happened? Why, why did it take 10 years to come back? And, and how, have the, how, how did you talk about the characters maturing and where, and where to pick up with them 10 years later with all of the shifts and changes in the industry? I think the first maturing we should talk about is our reaction to being canceled. <laughs> <laughs> T talk about that. It yeah. took 10 years. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I see. Um, I see. Uh, it was a surprise. Okay. And uh, Lisa has some theories on this which are really interesting about how people tried to justify why. I mean, now we have a, si a kind of an overview which is like everything new is dangerous and people don't know how to process it. Also, television wanted, there was no such thing as a small devout audience like there are now. You had to be a blockbuster every week or else it was deemed not a success. But it was very confusing for us. It's also kind of at the beginning of really cable picking yeah. up steam where you could be kind of an isolated niche. smaller show and more yeah, niche. Yeah. 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 Well, when we were doing it that first season, HBO kept saying, it's not like, we're not like we used to be. You know, it's not, it's not niche. It's not, it needs to be a it's hit because of it's Sex in the City. Phoebe, it's not Phoebe and, and Sex in the City. Sopranos, you know. Huge disappointment. So she, they kept trying to sort of warn us that it needs to do well. And I was like, I don't know what they're saying. It's going to be HBO different. And it won't be a lot of people watching. That's okay. <laughs> you know, and then that's it, what it you wasn't. do. <laughs> yeah, yeah so that's what you do. But it wasn't okay. And um, my observation after we got canceled was, um, Artists kept saying, what? I mean, what happened? They, I think they made a mistake. Like creative types, I keep saying artists, but you know, writers, actors, you know, directors, people would say, that was a great show. I, I literally they made a story in my head that you didn't get canceled. <laughs> like, because I was like, what? Why? Like, no. It was clearly their decision to wait. <laughs> like, that's what I made up in my oh, head. Oh, that's great. Okay, yeah, that's what happened. <laughs> so there you go. I love your story. <laughs> yeah. But they would say, oh, they, and they would just say, they just, they made a mistake. They just made a mistake. And because networks do sometimes make, they do make a mistake. They're just people. Clearly. Um, they do sometimes. And then executives that I was friends with who worked at networks or studios would say, um, so what was it? So it was, um, it was the ratings. It was, um, you know, what do you think it was? Like, they did it, it has to be right, so what's the explanation? Mm -hmm. You know, not questioning the decision. Mm -hmm. The creative people questioned the decision, the business people went, well, there must have been something wrong. There was something wrong. And we were left with no answers, just feelings. And then over the years, we got the salve of having people elevate it to like a uh, status, like people would then start talking about it years later, and it, it was the definition of a cult show. In other words, it, people found it over time, and people of influence. And you'd walk into writers' rooms, and writers would come to HBO and say, "I want to work at HBO because you guys did the comeback." And writers would be like, "I want to work." You know, it, it became sort of a thing, and and you hope for that, of course. And as the years progressed, it was so clear. There was a run as well of the first season on the Sundance Channel, I think, that also brought new audience to the show. Um, but it really built an audience the way a cult classic does. And there became a moment eight, eight and a half years later where it felt like I think other shows, this whole idea about a comeback of a show, the whole idea of Kickstarter out there, people raising money to do another Veronica Mars, people out there trying to revive shows, that notion of the groundswell of fans having an impact was sort of in the zeitgeist. And, you know, and Dan was talking to someone at HBO, you know, eight and a half years later. Right, right. And, <clears throat> and, that, and so it was really, they were sort of... Um, yeah, I think that, uh, you know, that might not be a bet. They, would they do it? Would Lisa and Michael do it? And then Dan said, I think so. And they said, well, will you? It was so, like no one, we didn't want to ask them, and they didn't want to ask us. It was sort of like we had a bad breakup, and, and yeah. I, if I, if I, I asked if you want to get together for coffee, are you going to go too far? I think it's like I'm afraid to be rejected again. No, they, he or, asked, yeah. and I was not, I was feeling inside, shit, yeah. You know, oh, you but I, you never want to say that. So yeah. I was like, you know, you're gonna have to ask them. I mean, I don't, I, you know, that's a question you're gonna have to ask. Yeah. I, I, I can imagine that, you know, and and it led to, I don't know how many months later, mm -hmm. it led to a phone call 
And it was an appropriate phone call for them to ask the creators of the show. And how did that feel when you guys got the well, call? Uh, we were so happy with people liking the comeback by really? then. Like, there wasn't like, oh, no. Yeah, oh, yeah. no. You didn't get... No, we were... <laughs> I, I personally was thrilled with what yeah. the comeback had become uh, and the yeah. work. Yeah. And so it was uh, tr tr uh, exciting. Mm -hmm. And then Lisa and I went to HBO with an unformed agenda or thought even, mm -hmm. except that over the years, Lisa and I would get together and I would say the most complicated situation I could think of to put Valerie in and just for fun say, what would she be like? And we realized she could be funny anywhere in any bad world. <laughs> Lisa, Valerie would be hilarious to me, to us. So we to were sitting too. on the to us too. we were sitting on the couch, and I told her that I drove in for my triumphant return to HBO, and the valet guy said, "Just park over there," and I was like, "That's so Valerie," <laughs> and immediately we started talking about Valerie at HBO, and then we talked to them, and went away, right, and then came back with the idea that we only wanted to do it if we could be again, focus directly on reality, which is Valerie doing a show on HBO. And they were like, yes, just and, go. And it. that drive into that valet and that elevator ride up to the waiting room, I mean, that became, talk about meta. That, it was absolutely what it feels like. I, I mean, it really... It was fun for us so to play exciting. with the reality of Valerie looking at the Sex and the City poster and thinking she's one of the girls now. <laughs> and, and then claiming that that started it all and then walking 10 feet and saying the Sopranos, they started it all too. And then not knowing any and of the any other Any of shows. the other posters. Uh, gave up, gave so up something. Nothing. Until girls. Sort of girls that... And then she gets Lena's name wrong and we did that immediately and... But what's so exciting also is that these guys start to explore not only Valerie, not anymore on a multi-camera sitcom, on an HBO darker show, which allowed them to explore darker themes for her, for all the characters. You know, Billy is this desperate to be on top, and I'll never forget that line where, where Valerie's like, you know, poor Billy, got too close to the sun. <laughs> Flew close to the sun. You know, like... We were about to hit become mega, mega, mega stardom, and you know, it's it, everyone gets hurt. And then to think about how to get Jane back was really a challenge tell for me, us. Tell me, tell yeah. me about that getting Jane back yeah, because so. what I love is kind of um, the seeming disparity, the the gap between those two characters, and then where they literally go like yeah. that by the end yeah. of season two. So and and getting getting. Laura back physically because you know actors had probably moved oh, on and a, getting yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We called that everybody was excited mm -hmm. and almost even more perfect. Oh, perfect. So talk about so getting Jane that storyline. How did that come about and and where to find her? You know, it was all about growth for us. How do you, <laughs> what happened in ten years? What happened in Valerie? We just showed a little bit of. So then we had the fun of trying to figure out what what who is Jane mm -hmm. now that we have a real shot and the yeah. big. Shocker to that scene was it's and we took two big risks in the second season mm -hmm. one was letting Jane have a scene on camera mm -hmm. where we're actually Shooting people shooting her as a person mm -hmm. Never had seen mm -hmm. and then at the end it was really fun yeah, really I, fun. I love that she won an Oscar for a short documentary yeah. like that was just such a nice Note and then just the Oscar in the room and every yeah. <laughs> as a door like another character yeah, which was throb as, as a door stop oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. oh that but okay. that was really fun yeah, yeah. We good as it do Jane has to have success you know as like an what she had set out to do originally like a lot of people who work on on reality shows you know you don't make money making documentary films so they have to have jobs and they. It's not their favorite day job, but they need to eat and live somewhere, so they have to do it. And that's what we imagined was why Jane Benson was even working on the comeback in the first place. Right. And so then we thought, okay, and time's passed, so she got to make her film. She won an Oscar for it, and then realized, like it can happen, that, okay, that didn't get me anything. It's fine. I have friends who have, who have won Oscars for shorts and have, hard yeah. <laughs> have not worked again. And, and it was important that trophy, Jane be... That's great gone yeah. from the business yeah. so that we could show that even Jane gets sucked back in the way Valerie did. Yeah, totally. Um, 
So what was it like shooting season two as opposed to season one because you had this break in between was, you know, how did, how did you feel diving back in? Was it more fun? What did it feel like an old shoe? Was it, was it pushing yourself in, a, in an even deeper direction? Talk about the experience of season two. I felt like every day I was at an amusement park with my friends. Yeah. Oh, I love it. it was I, the most fun. It was so much fun and it was so fast in the great creative way where there was no time to uh, overthink it. And Lisa would be filming a scene and John Reed would be directing in it and I would be writing two episodes later right behind them wow. on that stage. Yeah, it all it felt fast. like you're making a donut, someone's putting it in a box. Oh, wow. It was exciting. Oh, it was thrilling. It, it was thrilling. And, and it, everyone came back. I mean, I mean, and the fact that we got the same house, we got the exact same house as Valerie's house 10 years later. It's a big deal. It's it a is big a big deal. deal. And also we had one other stunt was who was going to be the star of the show. Yeah. And that right. was hard. And yeah. then when we thought Seth Rogen. Hey, how did that happen? How did, how did Seth come on? He loved the comeback. He, yeah. was, he had been a comeback fan. I, I know. Mean, it was just he that easy. He yeah. was like, yes. And he mm -hmm. made time. He was busy. Yeah. yeah. We yeah. had him for like one 24-hour period. Yeah. And I think we used we 20 of those hours. We shot everything that was around it before he came and then like literally just everything where he was in it we we filled it in like a week later and we like wrote, everything everything else that you see that's literally like around yeah that we, his face isn't in we was wrote, already shot we wrote the seth rogan dialogue thinking well it's seth rogan i mean this is our attempt and he read it and i went to the trailer and i said what do you want to do he says i'm doing it exactly as it's written every line oh come in my eye and everything that we thought <laughs> like uh, yeah he, was, he, he brought such humanity to uh, it, you know, like yeah. you really get to um, feel like y there's a there's a win there for Valerie through his humanity toward her because Polly G is being so yeah. awful. You well, know? you know, and in the first one, too, that's why Juno was so such a nice person, because we wanted to be clear. Our point isn't that actors and actresses are all horrible people mm -hmm. that this one has issues, mm -hmm. but they're but like not bad do. people. I mean, and she just has desires, right, that she, she wants. Does. You know? Well, I know, now we like her, but. <laughs> because you, know, you play her. But <laughs> yeah, she has her issues, you know, and we'll forgive her for them, because they're not, she's not an evildoer, you know, mm -hmm. but, but, but that actors can't, they are, some of them are just really decent human beings, and that's what we definitely wanted for whoever was gonna be the star of Seeing Red, the HBO mm -hmm. show, and, and, Seth Rogen fits the bill, too, because he is a really good guy. And it is a risk for Seth Rogen to be the star of a dark drama, too, you know? Right. It all made sense. Yeah. Like, if he would do a TV show, yeah, I think he would do that. And he actually, he actually said at one point, he's like, I kind of would do this show. <laughs> like, are you doing this show? Um, so yeah. And it got really dark and, and also uncomfortable the way it does, you know, with like the, uh, anyway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. That was a hard. That was a, that was an interesting dynamic in the editing room. Yeah, T tell me uh, about just that. figuring out what's t who, literally w how many how many seconds is too long yeah. on the the dynamic of that, and then Valerie smiling in that lap just mm -hmm. is like wow. It was so nice that you start to go to the credits too, yeah. so it kind of plays out and then it kind of fades out and it's not you know there, there's it, that was really I loved that choice that was really great. We always, we always tried to give the audience a little bit of a music release at the end of that, mm -hmm. like because there's no music in any of the show. Oh my gosh, I did not. Realize there's not that. a score. There's no music anywhere in the show until the credits because it's supposed to be raw Every, footage yeah. that's oh unedited. So the, we always. I have to watch it all again. <laughs> There's no music. That's amazing. No, but in the choice of the, the, your idea of having music be this release at the end yeah. during the credits, yeah. and the choice of that song being an important one was every episode, always. Well, I want to talk about another really big risk that you took on the show and, and where that idea came to be, which is the ending, when, um, which is so beautiful that, that, again, bringing in the Mickey and now knowing more about the backstory. Robert actually being sick of, of getting to the thing that Valerie wants, and they're at the Emmys, and, and then she leaves because uh, she gets a text that Mickey's at the hospital. So talk about leading up to the, yeah, why don't we, why don't we watch the clip? You wanna watch the clip? And then we can talk about. I think so, because from that moment, it's 
Yeah, It'll okay, be let's clip two to that, to whoever <laughs> does that. Thumbs up. <laughs> You're so amazing. Oh. You really are, like, I mean, <sighs> you know, we've walked this journey with Valerie and, and the cameras have been on her the whole time. Mm -hmm. and, and talk to me about the decision to, to finally see her not in front of the cameras. And I mean, that was a big risk. I remember seeing it and just being like, oh my, are they in Oz? Like, what, what happened? <laughs> you know, the Technicolor quality is just beautiful. Well, Michael, it sort of struck him in the writer's room one day. Yeah, I, I didn't know how we were going to do the last scene with Mickey. Mm -hmm. It just dawned on me, how can we be, how can Valerie be genuinely vulnerable with, with cameras on her in that hospital room? And then all of a sudden I just realized, what if, life gets bigger than her need to be on TV. And so that she leaves the cameras behind. And I said to Lisa, and we both were like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> it's, it's scary because the portal that she goes through, and also we had to contrive a lot. Yeah. Like the cameras couldn't be allowed in to the Emmys in the story. Jane is filming with an iPhone. That's an actual iPhone. I mean, okay. people weren't doing that even three years ago, whenever we did this. Yeah. And uh, so we had to contrive it so that she would be disappeared. And when she walks through that curtain, we knew she was walking through something else. Mm. And the only really amazing story about it is we always thought from the minute it became a movie, mm -hmm. there was going to be a score, music, to support all that. Mm. And the minute we put, and we had a brilliant composer who do a score, we put it on, it was too pushy. And then we had him go to almost nothing, and it was still too pushy. And we realized that the comeback doesn't tell you what to feel. Mm. You have to feel what you feel. Mm. So Lisa's is the music, and the helicopters, and the rain. And it, mm. we never changed how we cut it. We left it exactly that lush, but mm. just took the music out. It's so interesting, because you, you really hear Jane being like, no, you can't, you know, it's, it's like Jane's really, that's the, the crux of her you know, journey, and you're like, oh, I see you, Jane. <laughs> you know, that, there she yeah, is. Yeah, like, she gets really invested in yeah. the whole thing. She yeah. starts to really want to um, guide the way this is going to happen because she wants to make something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I mean, my one sort of regret that we had to pull back on, but one of the ideas was that um, there's a crew, because Jane is doing, now it's like a documentary, HBO liked the footage, and it's sort of a different story, and so now this is her doc, you know, a documentary, and documentarians are now, and reality producers are all part of the show now, mm -hmm. I don't know, if you've noticed that too, and, um, and so now there's like a, an additional camera crew now yeah. shooting Jane, shooting, and she's being interviewed off in the distance, yeah. you know, for... Uh, and then there was a day when we actually did have the HBO behind the scenes <laughs> documentarians yeah. filming, and it was, I almost passed out a couple times. Yeah. I really just didn't know what was what anymore. <laughs> But we also had a crew. We because did have we ha that extra it was crew day shooting that, yeah, you. It was the same day that we had like a fake, a fake documentary crew. crew that was shooting Jane, <laughs> shooting Valerie. Oh, and, and then HBO. The, and then HBO's HBO behind, the, behind scenes. the scenes crew was there. And <laughs> it just was so... And we were in the desert. Yeah. And it was like 110 degrees. And, and Lisa was locked in a trunk with a snake. And there were snakes. And Lisa was locked in the trunk with snakes. And it just was like, I, I, there was one point where I just was like, I just don't even know what's happening. I don't. And, and one little thing I want to say about our journey away from the cameras and that moment where Valerie opens, the very last two lines of the series as she and Mark are walking down the hall, we return to the Valerie because they've reunited and he... So thrilled that she's still inside there somewhere, yeah. that he says, um, "Do you want to go to any Emmy parties?" And the last line in the series is, uh, "Have we met?" <laughs> <laughs> so we restored that. her back to her full person, not like it didn't. All, she has all her loves now. Mm. Now uh, I, we're getting a little close to the end of our time, yeah. right? Um, right? And so. 
what, I, can we do a couple questions from the audience? No, we don't have any time. Okay. Well, then I'm going to ask a, a, a question because I'm up here and I have the microphone. <laughs> uh, talk about the future. Is there a possibility for a future of the comeback of the comeback? There's always a possibility. Really? Do you guys talk about it? If Eddie? this was a possibility, if this happened, yeah. I mean, we were just, look at this bottle water. It says louder milk, bottoms up. That's a promo. Yeah. This is so Valerie Cherish yeah. to me. Uh -huh. they, where television is now, mm -hmm. that it's like, um, you could do, it's, there's so much aggressive sales needed mm -hmm. that I, it's like a perfect humiliation track if yeah. that would be where television is now. Mm -hmm. These small shows that you've never heard of. Yeah. Not this, this isn't on yet. I'm talking about like the Cuckoo Network and the mm -hmm. wah, wah, whatever the... <laughs> Whatever the networks are that you can't even find, the idea of Valerie being lost in that, where's Valerie, where's Waldo in television, like doing hard work that's on the boo -boo network, you know what I mean? <laughs> Click, it's crackle, it's awesome, aha, they're all real yeah, networks. they're sounds, yes. they're just sounds. The, the, <laughs> there's no, listen, there's never the desire to, 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 to speculate about where Valerie is at any given moment, from the dry cleaners to London to New York to her living room to musical theater. And no matter what, it's always exciting. And it's just a matter of what's the story and what's the next. TV is so desperate now <clears throat> that it's like finally caught up to Valerie. So now she would go the next On level. That note. Soothsayers, fortune tellers. Well, I'm sorry I took up all of your time mm. with all of my questions because you're just here making all my dreams come true. Thank um, you. And thank you guys. So, thank you guys so much for what you've done, your work. It's beautiful. Yeah. It's inspired me. I can't thank you enough. Thank you guys for being thank here. Thank you, Abigail. Thank you guys thank you. for coming. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.